Let's start at the, at the beginning. Uh, Michael, I, I'm still trying to understand what is Watson. And maybe it's my hubris as a human, but my natural tendency is to keep trying to put Watson in a very particular box. In other words, as a very interactive form of Google, you know, or Google that can talk back and refine. Uh, so I want to know, really, what do you guys mean by a cognitive machine? What do you mean when you say Watson reads books or Watson has confidence? Is this drama to help us understand processes that are going on? Or does Watson read books? Does Watson have confidence? You know, what is, what is going on in there besides the database? All right. Um, five minutes, huh? Yeah. All right. Uh, OK, so uh, short story. Uh, I guess um, IBM, IBM Research has been working in uh, AI technologies for a very long time, probably 40 or 50 years. So when people talk about, uh, you know, Watson playing Jeopardy in 2011 uh, as sort of new work, I laugh. Um, we had a team in IBM Research working on, uh, you know, an open problem in AI called uh, Deep Question and Answer. And the, and the point was, can you build a system that can answer uh, open domain questions. Ask a question, get an answer, have the answer be useful. We built a system that um, answered a particular type of question we call a factoid-based question, uh, trained the system by reading uh, Wikipedia and by reading it's, you know, ingesting uh, enormous numbers of documents, uh, doing some natural language processing, uh, training the system to understand the kinds of questions in the case of Jeopardy that are asked and being able to uh, answer one, two, three forward questions in a very highly redundant corpus. So that's where we started. Um, the confidence uh, point is that you know, statistical uh, machine learning or deep neural network based learning, none of them are precise. So the, uh, the genius of what the, uh, the team did that built it was to do a, a pretty good job um, with um, you know, hundreds of different scoring functions and algorithmics to combine the scoring functions to produce a ranked set of answers. And along with that um, aggregation step is a sense of how good each answer is. That's where the confidence comes from. Fast forward a couple of years, what we've been doing is decomposing the original Watson system and augmenting it with many other uh, engines that um, we call cognitive, and I'll define that in a moment, to build a platform. So if you fast forward to where we are now, we're building a set of you know, cloud-delivered services, uh, which do interesting things, everything from answer questions to uh, analyze personality of a writer by um, analyzing their uh, words, not OCR, but literally the text that they, uh, they produce. And the idea is to build a system that derive, derives insight from signals, you know, um, extracting the, the signal from the noise, if you like. Um, did I get all your questions? Yes and no. I mean, the core question is, do you consider using the, the phrase Watson has confidence, problematic, as compared to saying Watson, you know, reports uh, the pr probability of correctness. That's fine. But I'm, do you see, but, but... I'm not hung up on the word confidence. I'm not saying, no, I'm hung up on the word has. <laughs> oh, you're hung up on the word has. Watson has confidence is very different than Watson can report the probability of, of uh, an answer's correctness. I'm not hung up on the word has either. But all right, but that's good to know because the the it seems that that the Watson team has kind of meticulously worked to present you know Watson in in the shape of a character or yeah. that has that certainly you know per, not just anthropomorphized but personified to the extent where maybe people think oh this is going to be a less a less threatening partner in your exploration because now you've got this thing that has confidence, but. There's sort of a choice there that's made, and there's a black box because it's all proprietary. So a lot of us in the outside, regular little world think, oh, Watson has confidence. But Watson doesn't have confidence, right? Yeah, so Watson is a computer program. 
with a lot of algorithms that a number of us know about or don't know about. And at the end of the day, Watson does a lot of processing and training in particular domains. And uh, then, depending on the algorithm you use, you end up with a probability, confidence is a fine word to use, of the, uh, the answer being uh, correct. But we talk about internally standard notions of precision and recall. There's no magic. Right. And there's no confidence, as it were. In other words, there's not a being with confidence. There's just like a, a Google result might say, you know, well, this is, uh, we, you know, our system predicts that this is 46% relevant to your search. Watson, the Watson algorithms have predicted that this is like getting 99% certain. 99 would be good. Yeah, for example. <laughs> but right, okay. Okay, because there's, I mean, I think a lot of what our conversation is going to be about is public perception of, of AI and where this is going and trying to kind of bring more rigor to the way we think about this stuff. If you've got a public who thinks that Watson has confidence, you can see where they get real chappy real fast. One of the things that's been interesting to me is when you, when you build a system that demonstrates traits that we associate with intelligence, learning, having confidence, whatever we want to call it. Uh, you're right, people do anthropomorphize it a little bit. And uh, you know, our view on what Watson is used for is to help people. You know, we don't um, you know, expect to see little Watsons all, all over the place uh, doing what people do now, but we like to look for use cases that you know, amplify someone's intelligence, gives them ability to scale, helps. So, you know, it's, uh, we don't say cuddly, um, although one of, the, uh, one of the companies we've been working with has a really cool little uh, dinosaur available in three colors powered by Watson for kids. But um, uh, it's in some sense gratifying to, to see that the system um, has been uh, sort of treated and accepted the way it has. Okay, and we're going to come back to a lot of this. Uh, so, Martine, I'm really interested to know what you mean, what you, what, you know, what what you mean by mind clones and cyber consciousness, and what informs what kind of from the real world informs these kind of uh, uh, predictions or visions of where things are going. In other words, it's not you know Philip K. Dick. We know what informed those visions of where things were going. It wasn't, but it, and it wasn't necessarily science that was going on or technology. It was, you know, medications. But so I'm, I'm interested because you are, a, you know, a, the CEO of, of various technology companies and a, a technology researcher. How, what sort of, what out there has informed, if you can explain these sort of these, these ideas and then what, you know, what, what you brought to bear to kind of assemble them? Sure. Um, so the, the book Virtually Human is basically a um, book of uh, ethical explorations. And I'm an ethicist and not a computer scientist. I take it the, as the premise for the book um, what is pretty much a thought experiment that um, suppose there is software that one or more uh, people consider to be humanly conscious meaning they believe that software uh, has the kind of interior feelings, thoughts, thinking, fears, etc., that another person would have. And if one or more people feel that way about some software, what sort of uh, ethical rights and obligations apply to other flesh people with respect to that software? and apply to that software itself. So if that uh, software, and in a, including an associated database, is uh, deemed by one or more people to be um, identical in their core um, consciousness to that of another human they know, uh, the best friend, um, themselves, their mother, what have you, uh, that's what I call in the book a mind clone, because the idea is that one or more people feel, wow, this software is me just outside of my body, or it's my mother, but outside of my body, my friend, but outside of my body. 
So what kind of ethical rights and obligations apply to other people in treating that software? What kind of rights and obligations apply to that software itself? And uh, that's, that's what the Virtually Human book um, spends its uh, 350 pages or so exploring. And these, the cyber consciousness, or the mind clones, are you thinking of them as conscious or as, uh, as good as conscious as far as the interactor? Well, as mentioned, it's, uh, there's a very broad continuum of possibilities because, as I know, it depends on what one or more people feel. So one person's conscious cat is, an, is, a, is another person's empty box in a, in a soft uh, feline sort of shape. So what I point out in the book is that you know, there's, a, there's an infinity of different perspectives that one would have with regard to whether or not any particular software is conscious or is a mind clone. And I suggest some different um, uh, methods for developing a larger social consensus as to whether or not this really is cyber consciousness or just a fancy puppet um, or an interactive journal or what have you. And I point out that you know probably until the end of time, there will be debates and arguments over whether or not um, what one person thinks is cyber consciousness is in fact cyber consciousness. Just like um, you know, after probably 10,000 years of humans and dogs hanging out together, there is still to this day a huge diversity of points of view. Somebody throws a dog out, out the car window on the freeway, um, and uh, somebody hunts you know, Cecil the lion in, uh, in uh, Zim Zimbabwe, and um, millions of other people are horrified, and sometimes the consent reaches to the level that it's a felony crime in, in you know, most states in the United States to throw a dog out your car window. And obviously, I agree with that point of view. And already in Zimbabwe and already around the world, there's a diversity of points of view on whether or not you know, the dentist who shot Zizo the lion was you know, a conservationist in, in drag or what have you. So, um, so that's, those are the issues that are, and it's, and it's really fun as, a, as an ethicist because this, the subject of the ethical discussion is itself as fluid as honey. And it feels as if these kinds of conversations are new. And you're alluding to the fact that maybe, especially with regard to things other than technology, they're old conversations. Old, old, old. I'm wondering, and this is where, where Dan can really come in handy. I mean, are, how old are these conversations? Is, are we in a unique conversation now, or is this something you've seen before? I think we've seen it repeatedly over, and there's a limit to documented history. Um, we can only know as far as human documentation, or perhaps even archaeology can go back and tell us, but um, maybe giving you concrete examples yeah. of ones that are directly yeah. proximal. I like the way, Martin, you're emphasizing the degree to which a society might project a view of consciousness onto something. Um, if we take the most recent point in time when we probably had something a little bit like the debate we have now about AI where there is great trepidation on the one hand but also massive uh, transcendental optimism about something on the other. It was about 20 years ago. It was in about 1994 when people were first starting to hear of this internet thing, and not a lot of people really thought it would catch on. And on the other hand, there were people who were proselytizers for a vision of cyberspace. The virtual was going to be a place into which we could penetrate another realm. But now, I mean, that's, that's an analogous situation. But now when we're talking about uh, what Michael describes a machine that does something that is perhaps like thinking, if we subtract all the metaphors such as reading and understanding and learning. Yeah, we've had lots of those. Um, my favorite is um, a guy called uh, Ramon Lull, or Raymond Lully, uh, a 13th century 
mystical philosopher who lived on Mallorca. And uh, the Argentinian writer Borges writes about him, interestingly. And he had a thing uh, which he called a thinking machine. And it was um, basically a, a machine made out of a series of concentric circles with terms written around the side, things like wisdom and truth and eternity, and all of these crossed cables in the middle. And what you could do would, would be you could rotate any of the disks so that the terms would correspond and deliver you a message. And he had a whole load of disciples who followed this thing called the Ars Magna using these machines. Now, when Borges analyzes these machines, he points out that Lull and Lull's disciples knew that the machine didn't think. It didn't work. They knew it was broken. But that really didn't bother them. Because what they did was they said, that's fine. It's fine that we've got the machine that doesn't work. We'll just combine it with another, and another, and another, and another. And by this recurrent process, this sequential process of comparing one against the other, you would eventually rectify the errors of the first and second and third. And what you'd end up with would be, of course, um, like not thinking, not thinking in that sense. What you would end up with, because he was a mystical philosopher, would be uh, the word of God. Now, I, when we were in the immersion center earlier, and I was looking at Watson, I was thinking that this recurrent neural network type of process is very similar to what Ramon Lull's disciples thought they were doing back in the 13th century. And they ascribed to it a kind of consciousness. Does that kind of, yeah. just to begin, yeah, I mean, when I, you talk I, about there are it lots like that, more it's examples. What, it's what my, uh, my ancestors thought they were doing when they were uh, uh, writing and rewriting Torah, and, and again and again and again, that it was an iterative loop through which uh, something extra happens. Um, that's, that's a really good example because it actually brings us to the ethical question, the ethical obligations that Martin was bringing up a little bit earlier, which is uh, what technologies in history have we granted absolute autonomy and executive power? Have we ever done that before? I mean, we're, we're talking at the moment about uh, the possibility of strong AI or of autonomous weapons systems uh, that can make their own decisions independent of human agency. Has that ever happened before with any piece of technology? And well, yes, of course it has. I mean, so long as you take a, a broad definition of technology that isn't just to do with tools and gadgets, but say that technology is an ology like any other, like biology, archaeology, it's the logic of the study of how to do things, the logic of techne, then, yeah, I mean, books are technologies. And we have granted absolute autonomy, absolute executive power, and absolute transcendence to the Torah, the Bible, the Quran, with um, varying degrees of complicated uh, real world effects. You left out the US Constitution. I was gonna say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, why don't we start with the Magna Carta? Yeah. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, but Stephen, so, there's a, there's a, it feels like a lot of times we go into this conversation about AI and then we end up talking about tools that are really good. We end up talking about sort of some kind of intelligence augmentation thing and everybody backs away from Chappie until we're back in the movies and then we're thinking, oh my God, mommy, mommy. You know, it ran around <laughs> looking for its mother. It's now, oh, that poor thing. Um, how do we bring rigor to this discussion? How do we develop an informed, rigorous discourse Okay. about this, and where is right. that happening? Okay, well look, what I'm gonna do in, in the brief period is just to sort of lay out some benchmarks here. First of all, I think it's, it's fair to say that this whole business of, try, of trying to create artificial intelligence that potentially can surpass whatever human beings can do is actually uh, something that I think is quite recognizable from the philosophical tradition. So in other words, there's nothing weird about this. 
Uh, in fact, most of, our, uh, most of our philosophical theories, especially in the modern period, about what it means to do science, how do you get at the truth, even our notions of ethics, whether we're talking about Kant or Bentham, actually presupposes agents that are much more powerful cognitively than ordinary human agents are. And in fact, part of what we call postmodernism is a retreat from that, right? Postmodernism is largely a retreat from that, saying, look, human beings aren't these super utilitarians. They aren't these, you know, you know I I infinitely principled creatures. They aren't, these prin they aren't these creatures who can just amass all possible evidence and then come up with the optimal solution to a problem. Right, uh, and that's what postmodernism basically has been about. It's been about kind of scaling down what it is that human beings should expect as reasonable. Okay, um, and and maybe there there may be biological constraints with regard to human beings, Homo sapiens, that kind of in inevitably makes sense of that idea. But nevertheless, it seems to me that you know, insofar as we do identify with the philosophical tradition and about you know, ideals of rationality and, and optimal goodness and all the rest of it, there is a sense in which artificial intelligence actually does respond to that, okay? And I think that always needs to be kind of seen very much. It is not a strange or weird thing, okay? Um, and I think, it, you know, so, so that's the first point to make. I do think, however, that as we uh, get into a position of improving artificial intelligence and all the rest of it, and I'm quite comfortable with the idea that we are going to do this, and that, uh, that then we're going to have some interesting kind of Turing test style problems. Because basically what we're talking about here is using a kind of sophisticated version of the Turing test as a kind of citizenship criterion. Okay. So in other words, you're trying to figure out, okay, is this being that has been artificially constructed that can do all these wonderful, amazing things and we think is very valuable in our society and so forth, are they sufficiently what, the X question, in order to count them as one of us, right? To give them citizenship rights. Now, the interesting thing about this- Like put, corporations or something. You're, well, yeah. well, no, but, but, <laughs> no, no but, 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 the, but the interesting point about this, of course, is if you look at, the, if you look at human history, uh, and, and the various struggles that members of Homo sapiens have had to fought in order to get citizenship, okay, uh, you know, whether we're talking about women or ethnic minorities or whatever, right? I mean, part of what has had to go on in that process is that one has had to think about the notion of belonging and citizenship in a somewhat more abstract way, so that in a sense you don't start off at the get-go being prejudiced because the thing isn't kind of the way you expect somebody to be in their physical composition, okay? Um, and, and I think it's taken a long time for that to actually be overcome, uh, and in fact, it's still a struggle today, okay, in terms of the way in which we interpret, you know, differently bodied human beings, you know, and, and you know, I res you know we, got, we, have, we have Martine here, but of course, even just talking about women, you know, in the biological sense, or even talk about ethnic minorities, right? I mean, the, you know, there's a sense in which in order to ascribe a level of equality where all of these beings can be part of a common citizenship, common society, right, has been an enormous struggle within Homo sapiens per se, okay? So we should expect that it will be a tricky issue, right? And that, and that the fact that we're, you know, we might end up in these kinds of, you know, if you've seen Blade Runner, right, these scenarios where you have actually a very sophisticated notion of the Turing test going on in Blade Runner, which actually kind of gets the interrogator going into the psychoanalysis of your relationship to your mother and things like that as a way of trying to figure out whether these beings are really human, etc. Right, I mean, we should expect something like that to happen, but that itself is not a problem, right? Any greater problem than the problems we've been facing in the past, okay? So I don't see this as a kind of in-principle problem. I just think it's part of the general problem of increasing enfranchisement. And this is why I actually like, I mean, one of the things that's very good about the Mind Clones book, uh, Martine's book, is that it gets into some of the legal stuff, right? And the criteria issues about what are you looking for, how do you judge these things, because that's what it's going to boil down to. It's going to be boiled down to judgment calls that can, uh, that, that can uh, end up receiving a, large, a sufficient amount of social consensus that then it gets accepted as everyone as the new normal. It, it seem, it's interesting to me that the conversation that we're having is basically about Watson's rights, where I'm, uh, before Watson or any AI actually becomes an AI, which may just be a fictional thing anyway, 
right? We have no evidence that there's cognition or that there's experience that's going to happen. It seems to me that that whole sci-fi scenario is a distraction from the very real impact that intelligent agents can have right now. As you know, Kevin would, would sh has shown us, you know, a, a, an algorithm following its instructions can crash the stock market and destroy wealth and lead to real problems. You know, before, so we're sitting here because we're so ethical, you know, worrying about whether this algorithm is gonna feel it if we turn the fucking thing off um, when it's extracting value from all of us because it's programmed to do what giant uh, Fortune 500 companies can do. Yeah, but that's just the problem value. with capitalism. Come on, but that, but that in it's a way is showing how ca capitalism is scaling up, and so that in Through a sense. Through artificial intelligence. Sure, yes, exactly, but that. But that I'm not. It is. I understand that. So we've had Philip K. Dick twice and now capitalism. This is like awesome. Keep going. It is. No, no, no. No, at, at no, 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 no. Because I do think the kind of issue you're talking about of how, ex how surplus value is going to be extracted in the future and how it might just be extracted just by our, our, our mouse clicks as we're making choices on things on the internet, right? I mean, I think that's a serious issue, okay? But that's an issue uh, th that you might say uh, is part of the, the problem of capitalism. I think... In a sense, we still have to address the issue of whether these machines have agency and what we want, you know. Yeah, but, I mean, as, and that was part of what that announcement uh, that, that Hawking and those folks did. I mean, the development of this technology dovetails very conveniently with traditional corporate capitalism in a way that seems more than coincidental, more than a side effect, because it's investment that's going into the most promising work in this field, and that investment is looking for a certain kind of return that... Yeah, we will teach doctors how to heal patients, but we're also really what we're doing is helping doctors cope with uh, big industrial medical, in, you know, uh, medical sure, problems. Sure, no, no, but this is where we need sophisticated social and political theory for the future. That's what we're here. That's us. We yeah, are yeah, 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 we, yeah. We, we are bar. the human intervention yeah, yeah, but I, I, right I, I, now. See, this I, is the moment no, that no, we created. I just, I just want, you to, yeah. want to make sure that you're not saying pulling the, to pull the plug on this. If we have to, sure. Oh, I'm not saying pull the plug or not. What I am saying is humans should intervene in the process. If well, you think course. intervention requires pulling out the plug, then we'll pull out the plug. I bet there's ways to intervene that so don't. So there's a journey here. You yeah. sort of jumped there. There's a bunch of intermediate steps. Let me That's tell you what, what I'm saying. I, well, we jumped to artificial well, but thinking Pete, things. Pete, yeah. let, me, let me tell you yeah. what I worry about. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as you pointed out, Watson does some fairly sophisticated things and we're using it for some fairly sophisticated tasks. And we are you know, writing systems to help people deal with scale and complexity. First domain we looked at after the game was uh, oncology. Every day I come in thinking about that is an incredible responsibility. So I worry that people forget, back to your discussion earlier, that these things are computers, that they do what they do, and I, I worry that people ascribe notions of intelligence or cognition or, you know, free will, thank you for no, nobody bringing that up, um, to, to these computing systems which are designed to help people solve problems. I, I very much worry that people forget what they are. Can I ask a question on this yeah, point? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, I don't know if you know, but there is this concept in library and information science called undiscovered public knowledge. Okay, so you know about this, right? Because when we had the, the, the little uh, you know, Watson immersion thing earlier on before this event, um, right, it was, it was about bringing together forms of knowledge, you know, that there's all this literature out there, no individual scientist can read everything, and so the idea is to bring the stuff together. Um, but the way it was presented in, in the demonstration, at least, uh, was it kind of Watson operating as a tool in the sense that you'd already have like a medical researcher or somebody who's looking to solve some kind of problem and then you'd sort of deploy Watson to kind of bring together the relevant literatures to try to come up with yeah. some sort tap, of... Tap you on the shoulder and say, what about that? Sure. Now, now the question is, is there any program, you know, any, any anticipation or any expectation that you could, that Watson could kind of do this for itself? Because as we know, you know, the vast majority of the academic literature goes unread. Right, and so there's a sense in which there's a potential. There's a potential. Someone's going to read my stuff. I read barely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm barely seriously. No, there's, there's, a serious, that part. there's a serious issue here because we, what, this is why it's undiscovered public knowledge is, in a sense, a new raw material being generated by the academic 
you know, uh, community that no one's really looking at very seriously to see how this stuff may be brought together. And, and if you look in terms of, you know, when we talk about research grants, especially in the sciences, right? Um, I mean, the levels at which you have to show that previous research has been done in a field that you want to get funding in is relatively minimal and superficial, right? Whereas, in fact, if you actually had very sophisticated kind of Watson-style things on the lookout all the time trying to mine stuff, you see what I mean? That they could actually come up with solutions to problems that ordinary humans might think, oh my God, I gotta new, do a new piece of original research because they've never put to, they never joined the dots between the different right. articles in different fields. Well, this is why Al Gore built the internet, if you remember. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's that's the man who did it. <laughs> yes. But that was his original conversation. That was what he was arguing. Well, no, but the point is, is, is you know, given that you're the so guy we, running the thing. So what, we, we've, you know, deployed systems that do that in a directed way. Uh, but why not have, can you program Watson to do it spontaneously? So I ask questions like that. The question I ask, uh, so we have a, my team is a mix of uh, engineers and researchers, and we have a, a brain trust of research at IBM as well. And I always ask them about programming the ability to do strategic thinking. To me, that seems, you know, the holy grail, so to speak, here. And they look at me and say, you know, that's a pretty hard problem. And I go, yes, it is. And, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing question. So I've never seen, I don't know if anybody here has seen people attempt to do this kind of thing. But that, that is what you're asking. About. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, because, you know, we're, we're totally insane in academia, right? We're constantly churning out publications that nobody reads. It's a waste of everybody's time and money, okay? I'm saying this in, to, for the camera here, right? That, that, <laughs> that there's a sense in which if you actually had some kind of being, whether it be human or Watson, actually reading stuff and trying to put stuff together, you might actually make a lot more progress a lot more quickly than just commissioning new research from scratch. Yeah, I mean the, the the one other thread I wanna I wanna explore before we then have everyone engage with us and be uh, start with with Martine with this is a there's a there's a it feels like a kind of a West Coast singularity trend, right? <laughs> Where people seem to be arguing or actually are at me um, <laughs> the idea that the the history of our very of our cosmos really is information striving for complexity. So it uses matter to become atoms, to become molecules, to become cells, to become organisms, to become cultures, to develop a civilization, and now we have machines and silicon, and as silicon, and as our machines become more complex than us, they are essentially the next level of evolution, and then we are really only important in that journey insofar as we can keep the machines going. And when I argue, no, no, humans, humans matter, they say, oh, well, you only say that because you're a human as if it's some kind of a hubris. Um, that, it, that concerns me, but uh, as an ethicist, is this, is, this, is this a kind of a hubris or a, a solipsistic understanding of consciousness and, and what matters? So first of all, I, I live on the East Coast. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I can't speak for the people on the West Coast. Um, but um, I completely agree with what, with what you're alluding to. I think it is totally ubriistic. Um, from my own uh, ethical uh, well, I'm a very big believer in just sort of, I would say, like the school of awe and, and wonder. And so to me, um, just appreciating you know, the plants outside, the, the beautiful design in here, each individual as, a, as an individual person, this is a, enough purpose for, for the whole universe, you know, right there. We can't help ourselves uh, creating uh, greater and greater degrees of order and complexity. Um, and we can't help the fact that so often that order and complexity crashes down on us. Um, the road to hell is, is paved with good intentions sort of thing. So um, I, I would be really skeptical myself about um, an ethical uh, paradigm based on some kind of uh, Nietzscheistic view that we're on this, you know, railroad uh, to Ayn Randism, you know. And um, instead, I would be much more comfortable with, a, uh, with an ethical worldview that was based on um, cherishing the, the beauty and the importance of all the life that's around us. 
That was poetic. That's, 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 that's what you got. That's what I do. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I only just got rights a couple years ago as a transgendered person, so <laughs> I'm not going to go running for office. <laughs> no, you could join Larry Lessig, great. Right. Um, that's another story, another story for another day. He's running for president. For he is? Yes. Yeah, because party? the pack failed, so now, yeah, and now run. Committed. He'll decide. Oh, okay. I was gonna, I was gonna, it just, I was gonna d jump to Dan for a minute because it seemed like we're, we're sort of talking about there's this natural urge for an omega point, you know, I mean that might I don't know if that's you know male and Christian but it's certainly, it's certainly old. You know what I mean? This this notion that this singularity happens or this flip happens that that there's this moment and after which then you know Ray Kurzweil's dad talks to us. Or, or, <laughs> you know what I mean? There's that moment that we're transcended. Um, is that, where does that come from? Is that alchemy or something? Or is this, is this new? That we somehow, you know what I mean, evolve beyond ourselves, that the next thing happens, that we have another species, you know, homo digitalis. Ooh, I like it. <laughs> the desire, the desire to produce uh, uh, duplicate simulations that have some kind of transcendent aspect to them is, uh, in actual fact, a profoundly not a scientific endeavor at all, but an artistic endeavor. And so one of the things that is happening here is that uh, something that's an artistic inquiry is being talked about in the frame of AI in scientific terms. And I think that causes a great deal of confusion. Um, there is the desire to transcend always, or to have some transcendent quality. But there's something else going on here as well. There's also a sense that there's another thing, a thing in nature called emergence, or in um, computing terms, when we're talking about AI systems or autonomous weapons, we call it unintended consequences or unforeseen <laughs> consequences. It's sometimes good and sometimes bad, but it's when you combine certain elements or functions or processes in order to what, and you don't know that you're going to produce something new. Do, an example would be probably, a, ba a, a very basic example would be uh, the oldest bit of technology known to man, the fire drill, the stick for making fire, where you rub the stick kind of, and you keep rubbing it on the tinder, and eventually what happens with uh, one iteration of the stick where it's got a string around it, and you're pulling the string, is that it cuts a spiral into the stick. And this is thought to be, by our archaeologists, where the threaded screw came from. Because you've got an object that's then a threaded screw, but you didn't set out to create a threaded screw. You set out to create fire. And in the process, totally unintentionally, no agency at all or no human agency, you discovered a form inherent in nature the helix, and you discovered a human function, a human use for it. Now that's a very positive example, generally taken, but uh, it's also perfectly possible that we can produce unforeseen consequences that are not so positive for us. And I, th I think those anxieties are worth yeah. dealing and with. Yeah, and emergent has become this sort of religious excuse of, of science on a certain level, and it's where they shove all that sort of mystical stuff. Well, it's going to change state and then, oh, well, we'll get emergent behavior. We'll get emergent, you know, consciousness is just emergent. You know, it's sort of, it's become a hand wave uh, on, on certain levels too. I mean, it's, it's real and mythological. But um, so you all are smarter than us, or certainly smarter than me. Um, what are you all thinking? I mean, wh where do you come for? What, what would you like to know from, from <laughs> Food. <here? laughs> I mean, I have bringing it back down to like the here and now kind of points. Um, I think that there's still a lot. Oh. I think there's still. I think it I, just, it goes into there. Okay, thank you. And you're going to pick people after <laughs> this, right? In English, in English, you say something really, really smart. <laughs> um, I think there's still a lot of confusion around the terminology. What you know, marketing technology companies are doing now, um, how they're utilizing um, AI to 
um, sell, to influence, to convince. And I'm interested to sort of know, in a, in a sense, what's happening now. And to your question, when we were doing, doing the tour, um, you know, where does the obligation begin in terms of informing the consumer slash user? Yeah, well, maybe start. We start on some of this. Some of this disclosure. It certainly feels like our phones are getting smarter as we get dumber. You know, and the more we use mythological language to describe these things, the less informed people actually are about the fact that this Watson is not thinking at me. He's, you know, doing whatever he does. Yeah, I'm. I'm I, I have to say that. I mean, it, it, you know, the thing that you're alluding to that took place in the tour. Um, I was a little surprised, and again, this isn't, you know, maybe a question about where IBM sees its own responsibility with regard to these matters, because as it, as these, as something like Watson gets smarter and smarter, is able to amass more data and actually to be able to learn from that data to be able to inform in a more strategic way various sorts of insurance underwriters, which was what the question was about that I asked, um, to what extent are end users entitled to know this additional, you know, what is going on? Right, and and the answer that 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 I received uh, was basically it'll vary from insurance company to insurance company, and that Watson itself doesn't feel any kind of particular, you know, IBM doesn't feel any kind of particular obligation with regard to what it might want to prescribe as you know appropriate levels of information that end users ought to have in order for these insurance data to be known more, you know, you know, so they can make informed decisions, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just, I mean, so there, there is a kind of practical question here about where, where you think your responsibility ends with regard to this. Wow, so this is an old, 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 old problem. You know, most recent one that comes to mind is this internet safe harbor discussion, same thing. Um, you know, what's your editorial responsibility? And, uh, and uh, you know, the answer you were given was uh, my take as well. Um, I don't want Watson to have the responsibility to have to do that. I want a person to do it. But, but don't you? Right. But then how can IBM present these technologies in ways that continuously imply the transparency benefits? In other words, that, that IBM, that's the main thing I'm looking at tonight now, is IBM is responsible for the way Watson is being characterized. So if Watson's being characterized as, and I know it's no matter to you, but the company's doing it, characterized as a kind of a person. I, I, I do work for them. I know, but, but you know what I mean. I, I'm not saying that you're responsible for the personification of Watson or for trying to lead people to feel like Watson is you know, uh, confident or not confident, but that's the way he's being presented. Likewise, Watson's... Uh, attributes are being presented as the ability to give to you know to, to empower insurance companies to do actuarial data on our Facebook and God knows what else is out there rather than saying oh and look what Watson can do is can inform all these people about what kind of data is being used so they know how to change their lifestyle in order to be right. better insurance risks right. it's a it's a matter of presentation I mean, so, so there's all this stuff about the atmospherics of agency which is all this stuff about the atmospherics of agency, which we've experienced, this kind of sense of intentionality, this sense of friendliness. But what about, I mean, but there are situations where, where this, the question of responsibility is much more concrete. I mean, I'd like to ask the panel how you'd go about programming your self-driving car. Should it be in a crash situation? Should it be programmed to maximize the safety of the person inside the car at the risk of uh, hurting people outside? Or should there be some sort of utilitarian principle where the car makes a calculation that plowing over the 10 people at the bus stop is That's worse than pay. killing you? <laughs> right, well, well, is, right. Is, it, is it that? I mean, there's there's a life and death situation yeah, yeah, which will be programmed the into, no, into, the, right. into the a, a very imminent technology. And I would like to know how we're going to handle that ethical question. How do we handle that? Someone. Um, Anyway. Well, not very well. I, I, I know the problem to which you're referring, and it's being debated kind of repeatedly in just basically two ways. The two ways you outline, you know, calculation of um, utility uh, versus kind of privileging. Um, user. Yeah, the user. Um, but traditionally, uh, I'll go back to Ramon Lull and the way Borges talks about thinking machines. He says that thinking machines um, mythologically have always been and can be defined as the desire to um, uh, create 
a methodo methodological application of chance to solving a problem. And the problem you're posing here is, you know, what to do in a kind of life or death situation where there are multiple lives involved. And the answer of a, a thinking machine like Lull's would be that you need to have a much more complex system. You need to be able to calculate many, many, many more variables in order simply to minimize the number of deaths. But that's not good enough, though, is it? It isn't in good the, enough. In the Watson model, you've got the, you've got the various factors that are, that are used to score things, and then you have a set of algorithms that are used to rank the importance which those scores are given. So somebody's going to make a decision here. Yeah, there's, going to be some, there's going to be some responsibility somewhere, legally, I, ethically. Can I, can I take a shot at Please. this? Please. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of these self-driving cars, I think what will happen, this is my guess, assuming these things come into existence, that there will be a kind of uh, plastic aspect to this. In other words, that you, as the person who buys this thing, will have an opportunity to program it to a certain extent. And so if the car ends up doing horrible things, it will have been as a result of the specific programming that you added beyond what the manufacturer added. Okay, so the manufacturer will provide some basic things that will enable the car to be self-driving, but in terms of how one calculates risks and, you know, when will the car speed up and all this kind of stuff, that will actually be led, that will be left to the person buying it to actually program those final bits. And so if it then leads to some kind of catastrophe, you are responsible. And the insurance well, actuary will have seen. The <laughs> well, that might be useful too, right? That might be useful too as you're driving along. That would be the next step in GPS or something. But, but, uh, I, but I think that that's kind of the way to go on this, right? Where, right? In the sense that I think manufacturers are kind of smart enough that, that people will want, that part of the self driving thing is also to enable a certain amount of discretion with regard to the car owner. Because after all, people who own cars like to, the discretion is part of what is the whole idea of you know the, the freedom of the road and all this kind of bullshit, right? But you uh, can't have total discretion because they're no, going no, no, to be be no, 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 they'll they'll be be have to be legal parameters. I can't program legal. my car to go to blood donor mode all the time and no, you know, no, kill no, everybody no, no. else on there the road. There will be no, no. There'll be no, no, no. I so no, no. There, there will be there will be limits as to where how you can program. And those will be legal things. Those will be legal things. But then it's up to you to decide. And if you end up deciding to program your car in such a way that it does lead to a disaster, it's pretty clear it's as a result of your program. So we're, out, we're hitting on something that we talk about a lot. Um, so there's two issues here. One of them is liability. So presumably when you buy a car, whether it's self-driving or not, you assume the liability of driving it, assuming the car behaves as intended, which brings you to the second piece here, which is, um, back to your unintended consequences point, um, how does one uh, validate that the car is doing what it's supposed to do? Whose responsibility is it for the car functioning? And in fact, can you even assert what a self-driving car is supposed to do? Yeah, but if you're able to program it in a certain kind of way, if you've got that kind of discretion, and that is, in fact, what ends up leading to explain what the, 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 the reason for the crash is, then it is your fault. That's the thing. That's so why is, I think it, is it his fault if he takes the car... Right off the line. Oh, yeah. If, if in it, default mode. In, def thank oh, you. in yeah. default mode. In default mode, no. Okay, that's a so different... So then how do, we, how do we make default? I mean, I guess default, you just distribute injury as evenly as possible and have an algorithm <laughs> no, for No, I that. don't think it'll be so... It'll one be foot, kind of hand, like one... what we do now. I know, well, you know, I don't know how they... It's kind of what we would do now. I would think that the default mode is kind of what we do now, right? And, and Self-preservation. Uh, that was my point on liability, yeah. exactly. I'd like to try to turn this around a little bit. Um, my name is Mark Stallman. I'm president of the Center for the Study of Digital Life, uh, which, among other things, is an attempt to recreate what Marshall McLuhan did in the 1960s with his Center for Culture and Technology at University of Toronto, which, by the way, was funded by IBM. Um, they're Cana not like Canadian. They're not like by IBM Canada, correct? Oh, I'm Canadian. No, oh, he's good. Canadian. He's good. Well, then uh, we should talk. Um, the the point I want to make here, and the question I'd like to ask is, what do these technologies do to us? Um, and I want to be more specific about that. Uh, I was a computer architect in the 1970s, and everybody who's a computer architect knows that computers don't compute, 
they remember. The structure of all computers, including Watson, isn't a how fast I can do this, but can I find the stuff I need to find and move things around? So human memory was radically transformed by the alphabet. We now have a company called Alphabet. Yes. As of yesterday what, or what, something. What will, <laughs> what will these technologies do to human memory? Help us forget. <laughs> It's interesting. What, what will they do? I mean, I'm, and, and, and while we're at it, I'm interested in what the, if the, what the bias of the technology is. So does it make a doctor more compatible? That's what I was sort of asking before. Does it make a doctor more compatible with, with uh, big pharma, say, you know, rather than uh, more compatible with some vitalistic uh, sciences or something else? No answers about memory? Well... I, I, do have a, I do have an answer to the, the, the way you opened the thing about what, does the, what do these machines do to us, because I think that is an interesting question. And here I would just bring up this, this, this concept from social psychology of adaptive preference formation, namely that the more that you deal with machines and computers as a basis for getting along in life, the more, the, the more that becomes kind of a normal way of being and how you will then recalibrate what you think the human is in terms of what those machines can do. And I think that's one of the things, to be honest with you, even though people talk about that as part of the dehumanization process, where we become more machine-like, might end up being one of the means by which we actually incorporate the machines into our life world you know, as fully-fledged agents in the long term. Namely, we don't see such a big difference between them and us. Uh, but I do think that is one of the things that, that one does need to, to watch for. I mean, Sherry Turkle, who's this ethnographer at MIT, who studies the way in which children who, you know, interact with computers and so forth, how they personify them and so forth. And, and, and I think this is kind of part of, the, part of the issue here, right? The more that we interact with all this stuff, the more that it kind of it normalizes it and it becomes more... We, we see the, the difference between the machine and the human is blurring from a sort of standpoint of sentiment, emotional attachment, you, whatever. Right, but even specific to his memory question, I mean, and this maybe is a good question uh, um, for you, is, you know, when we got pencil and paper, we started to make lists, and, I mean, that's the first thing we really did with them, we make lists so that we don't have to remember. So now we have an externalized list, so our memory is freed up. But we are still, in, in, in list print world, we're still the ones who are responsible for putting information together in order to make associations and make decisions. Now we're saying Watson has this ability to take the two pieces and put it together. So it's no longer just memory, but the assembly, the comparison of two pieces of intersection of data in order to draw a conclusion. If we're depending on machines to do that, what is the next, what is the higher order thinking that people are still doing? This is a pretty old one, I should ask Dan. Um, you know, anything old is yours. <laughs> well, so no, no offense. And how does that, and how does it, you know, well, does, I, it does it I, diminish I, I, our, I, our I, com compositional ability? You know, I always, I always ask a couple of dumb questions. You know, when we learned, when we all bought calculators, or at least I did, I had a little square root button on it. I don't think it made me less capable. It let me focus on other things. When I got a cell phone, same thing. So I actually hope that systems like this give us a little more time to be human rather than uh, less. That's, that's my... Right, but being human now involves comparing pieces of data in order to blah, blah, blah. Being human after we have machines to do that is going to be a little something different. Yeah, so... Yes. That's all. I mean, that's right. sort of what he's that's arguing. Exactly so true. what it means to be human, our, our primary functions will change. That's right. That's okay. Yeah, I'm not saying it's bad, but it's interesting to try to figure out how. Kevin. Um, so um, there's this there's the story of this thing that happened in 2005 that probably like half the people in this room know really well and the other half don't know and I, who knows but anyway uh, and it's around it's around chess um, which was which was basically sort of the first target for um, uh, understanding the threshold of domination in terms of man versus machine intelligence um, and basically. Uh, Chess was considered a solved problem. Um, there will never be a human that's born uh, from this point on who will be able to beat even a mid-level uh, uh, set of chess algos. But so in 2005, um, Play Chess uh, did, a, did a, an online tournament that was freestyle. And they said, anybody can bring whatever they want to the table. They said, you want to bring strong algos? What, 
you want to bring, you know, a hundred people, whatever you want to bring, bring. And, uh, the way that this story gets told is, is Kasparov is reviewing, uh, that, that match. And Kasparov says that, uh, he says, he says, of course, two very predictable things happened. He says, first of all, of course, you know, the best algo beat the best chess player there. And he says, and he says, of, and of course, the best algo was easily dominated by a mid-level grandmaster playing together with a machine, which is not an of course for most people. It's an, it's an of course for Kasparov. And then the thing that surprised Kasparov is, is that who won, in a, you know, like where anyone could bring anything to the table, deep blue, anything you want, what won were two American amateurs with nine laptops, right? And Kasparov talks about that, that, that what, what actually dominated was the ability to coordinate uh, complex and heterogeneous ideas uh, among the humans and among the machines. And the question is, what is that? How, how, do, how do we explain that outcome given the premise of, let's say, this building, right? you know, or, or everything that we're talking about today. And is that just, do we understand that as a threshold problem? That, you know, maybe five years from now, two amateurs with nine laptops won't work anymore. Or is there something essential about the quality of human intelligence and this other set of things that I'm not gonna call intelligence, but these other processes that does in fact dominate in any bounded contest? Like, how do we explain it? I think it, I, th I think it's a little bit like um, all your work um, that you did on high frequency trading algorithms, and uh, the assumption was that uh, because it's all happening within the, the on Wall Street, on the stock market, the same stock market as people are trying to trade at normal speeds, it all happens within the same domain, but. Generally, when this kind of thing happens, you know, let's say if somebody brings along a couple of very, very high-speed algos to help them do something, there is some um, kind of complaint that, hey, that's cheating. And so you start to establish rules for different domains of behavior, whether it be for machines or for humans or for humans and machines, such as we see in um, Pistorius. Uh, there are Steve was pointing out Pistorius is not the poster boy for kind of human enhancement anymore for very good reasons. Um, but y you establish rules and divisions between this support or unsupported, and therefore it's a kind of, it's not a threshold. Rather, you post facto erect, a, erect different domains in which things can happen. And of course, you can bring along, bring along something. If you can sneak a uh, a machine like, you know, one of those uh, in Nevada, they've banned those uh, machines that you can sneak in to cheat in the casino. You know, it's perfectly possible to game the system, but then our whole obligation is to then work to try and stop the system being gained. But it's not a threshold question, it's a, a domain one. I well, I'd actually like to continue a little bit with your question, because I don't think it was really answered, because what it actually comes down to is, do you think that there are domains, that there are things that will always remain something that humans will somehow dominate? That if you put people together in some way, let's say you work with a number of people together and some machines, that's going to dominate over what you could build into a machine. Is there something that de facto somehow cannot be made AI? So can people and some machinery beat Skynet? Yeah, basically. Get some, maybe we should get some other people <laughs> to answer. It seems like other people want to answer this. <laughs> we're quirky. Okay, so the way in which this, this is being curated is everybody in the room is so, please introduce you all so everybody can I'm Carla Ganis. I'm the assistant chair of Digital Arts at Pratt Institute. This is Peter Patchen, chair of uh, Digital Arts at Pratt Institute, and we've been working with Luke for 
quite some time, and uh, I'm a big fan of you. And thank you so much. Uh, I'm speaking from the perspective of an, ar of an artist. There's a Jeff Koons in the lobby, right? And so my question is, one, we haven't even been able to reverse engineer our own brains, right? And we can't, uh, can't understand our own programming on some level. And what happens, or what is your perspective on the machine that isn't functioning, isn't, you know, just, uh, you know, analyzing data? What about the machine who's doing something that's non-utilitarian, like the artist? And a lot of artists, like myself, are working in the digital domain. I rely on the machine, you know, and its algorithms to produce my art. And so I have started to develop a symbiotic relationship with my machines. But how do you feel about the machine who isn't thinking in a utilitarian way, or maybe I shouldn't use the word thinking, but isn't functioning that way? And what are the possibilities in that domain? UMD, this is kind of your area. Yeah, There's some yeah, Plato's absolutely. Republic yeah. thing you can say, probably. So, sorry, <laughs> some, what? Some sort of Plato's Republic answer to that. <laughs> no, so, I mean, so, it, in some ways, you know, it, it, yeah, we've been talking all in this very Jeremy Bentham sort of, you know, perfection of society thing, and not about the, the quirkiness and strangeness of human experience and yeah. how computers aid our sort of consciousness and experience expansion rather than just our, our you know, cognitive ability. But, there, but there, there are two issues, it seems to me, that you're raising that, that I take to be a little, little different. One issue is, is this symbiotic relationship that you have with the machine. Um, and so, of course, we can talk about cyborgs, right? And you're, be, you're becoming a cyborg, basically, in your she, artistic mode. She and Ed, I just read March Pierce's 1991 piece. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, th so the thing is that so there's this issue of cyborg agency. Right, which is and, and, and as it were, respecting what that is, you know, and giving it the credit that's due uh, is, is, is one thing. But then there's this other issue that you're raising with regard to the machine's capacity to perform art by itself. And, and I'm just wondering, why wouldn't you want that to be subject to something like a Turing test? Namely, if you cannot tell whether a machine did it or a human did it, right? And you, and you had some fairly rigorous way of doing the Turing test, right? Many, it wouldn't just be one question or two questions, it'd be a very sophisticated kind of thing. Uh, would this, wouldn't, uh, would what, this Turing so test be the question, is it art? Yeah, exactly. But why wouldn't you? <laughs> and, and programs, and it's really interesting because it seems like throughout the 20th century, artists really were trying to reconstruct the machine. Well, they were trying in relation to machines, Picasso in relation yes. to photography, yeah. you know, and in, in relation to physics. And then later on, conceptual artists in the 60s who, you know, are starting to work in this way that is distanced from emotion and it's about a set of instructions. And Saul LeWitt gives a set of instructions to a team of assistants, you know. And so it's really interesting that we've started to emulate the machine. And so what happens in terms of, you know, the artwork that's produced by a machine, is it going to be in the lobby of a big... <laughs> well, yes, no, no, I, th I think like the answer Jeff is... Jeff Koons downstairs? No. Well, look, and look, Jeff Koons didn't make the but art. Look, if you, if you right, look a at, machine made it. If you look at the trends at the moment in... in, 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 in what are in, those implications? If you look at the trends at the moment in, in the philosophy and the sociology of art, there is a tendency to be very radically conventionalist about what art is, right? Art is basically what people regard as art. Yeah, but, but we're back to the question of the... And so the point is, in, in principle, this opens it up to the Turing test question, right? Namely, that if people take it to be art and treat it as art because it's past certain kind of criteria, and you can set the criteria as you will, then it is art. Because no, that's, in fact, wait, how we deal with it with human no, wait, beings wait, wait, at the wait, moment. But you might, that's how you we might, deal with it with human you beings. Might, hold on, but... Uh, yeah, I want to know if it's you might, the, the, yeah, the, No, but the substance doesn't matter here because with on. human beings, we already do a kind of Turing test test for art. We do, but, but hang on a sec, because we, we may have the medium and the message reversed here just a bit, yeah. depending on what you think is the purpose of art. So if a machine can make a great piece of art, and it's great, and I don't know that it's not a human, blah, blah, and it affects my little neurons and does all that, so art has served a purpose of aesthetic manipulation of my senses and made me feel a certain way, if that's the purpose of art. But if the purpose of art is to serve as a medium between me and another human being, well, that's if that's the issue. purpose of yes, of a different, a very different, a different. But issue. if that's the purpose yeah. of the art, then we have to think about it differently again. Yeah, that's then, a different issue. You're right. That is a different issue. There are artists now who are starting to develop or produce works where 
they're, they're thinking about computer vision and they're developing work for computers instead of for other things. There you as go. The, as the there audience. There you go, exactly. Ah! <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. No, you're right on the money there. That's right. Right, but this computer wants it. Right. Right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Connor Rusimano. I'm co-founder and CEO of OpenBCI, which is an open source com company dedicated to essentially understanding the brain. Uh, but I also teach at Parsons, so I have a little bit of that, that art essence in me. So actually, <laughs> Carla stole about half of my question, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it back up. Um, it seems as though there's somewhat of a consensus here that Watson is not a thinking machine, but rather a highly specialized machine for answering complex questions. Um, I, I want to ask questions. Is this truly artificial intelligence? Are we are we are we considering that artificial intelligence? Um, it seems as though you know that I'm I'm actually like it's curious to me that we haven't talked more about the notion of reverse engineering human intelligence and instilling that into artificial intelligence. And so this question is mainly directed at at um, Michael, but I'd like to also hear from Martine as well. Um, what is the value in reverse engineering human intelligence before embarking on this grand challenge of, of building or creating or designing artificial intelligence. Do you think that's necessary? Um, can the ultimate AI be created without fully understanding human intelligence? Yes. Um, yes. And are you Watson? Yes, you can. Uh, putting research <laughs> into reverse engineering the human brain before? No, you don't. You don't need on. to do it. Here <laughs> yeah, well, um, I hate questions like that. Um, let me tell you why. Um, I, um, and maybe I'm just a little too pragmatic. Uh, I don't get wrapped around the axle on, you know, whether it's an artificial intelligence or not. Um, what I tell people is we built a computer program, a very sophisticated one, using a lot of technologies associated with the field of AI that's been developed over a long time, uh, that does something useful and interesting and valuable. Um, and there is, you know, a, um, a highly charged debate in uh, in the field that, per your question, I I just find that question distracting. Sorry. Now, you, now, Martin, say something. Martin, say something interesting. So one thing that uh, your question brings to mind to me. Um, and continuing on the Canadian theme that we've sort of, everybody's saying something Canadian or Marsh McLuhan um, every few minutes. Um, my good friend uh, Steve Mann, who is a Canadian, uh, has come up with, I think, a, a very helpful uh, model for dealing with uh, human interaction with technology. And it's this uh, model called uh, SUVALENCE, uh, S-O-U-S, valence. Um, spinning off of the concept of surveillance. And his idea is that um, a somewhat egalitarian society is based on the fact that um, whatever I can, whenever I can observe you, you can observe me, okay? And that's kind of like from the tribe to the nation, we've kind of respected that ethic in the vast majority of instances. Uh, that's why like the peeping Tom is such like a, a bad person because one person can observe and another doesn't know it. So then you begin to get into all of the surveillance technology that's out right now. And Steve's point of view, um, Professor Mann's point of view, is that uh, there's nothing wrong with surveillance per se so long as whoever is being surveyed you know, has the right to survey the surveyor, which is what he calls surveillance. So if the city of New York wants to have cameras all over the place, uh, no problem, but anybody who is a resident of the city of New York or happens to be in the city of New York then should have the right to go into that surveillance center and survey the people who are surveying us. And that will help you create a better. Now, what does all this have to do with your question? It seems to me like all of this Watson type of technology, all this AI type of technology, is actually a kind of a microscope telescope into all of us. And that idea is made you know, very explicit with the concept of like big data, uh, which is people can see that under that term, 
that somebody is looking into all of us. They're not looking to us with like an optical lens, but they're looking into us with kind of a digital lens, if you will. And so, um, I mean, I think the, the surveillance point of view, which would be my point of view, is that uh, that which is looking into us is only the right to do that is subject to an obligation that the looked at gets to look back into it. So if somebody wants to use my data, I have the right to look at all of the data that's being acquired in a way that means something. Now, finally, coming around to your, to your question, I think it makes a huge difference if a kind of, you know, no offense, uh, dumb, tech, dumb AI technology like Watson uh, looking at me, I would like to know that, and I would like to have an ability to see in a way that's understandable to me how Watson is looking at me, or if a much more souped up future Watson uh, based on reverse engineering of the human brain, uh, something that even if it's far away from consciousness is nevertheless tuned, it's a telescope, it's a microscope, it's a camera, tuned like a human brain is looking at me. And I think if this reverse uh, uh, brain engineering effort gets into computers, and I personally think that's all but a foregone conclusion, um, that it's important that it be labeled as such. I mean, that's kind of like much more important than even a GMO label. You know, like human-based observation uh, organism or digital digitalism, and that um, all of us know that and have a right and um, and an absolute empowerment to see everything that's being observed about us, to understand exactly what parts of the human brain have been reverse engineered and embedded into that technology. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let, let me ask uh, answer this. In a, in a slightly different way, namely, what I think is most interesting, because I don't actually think reversing the brain, uh, reverse engineering of the brain is really necessary for artificial intelligence to make progress. And if we ever regard artificial intelligences as agents and so forth, it'll probably have nothing to do with whether or not they have anything like our brain composition or, or organization or anything like that. So, so I'm okay with that. But I do think there is an interesting aspect of the, of the human brain, and that's its energy efficiency with regard to the computational power that it has. And that, it seems to me, is a really interesting problem, right? Namely, the amount of efficiency of what can be done, because when computers do try to replicate some of this, it takes enormous amount of energy to do, right? And so, and so there is a kind of interesting core problem about, about the brain with regard to energy efficiency that, 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 that I think you know, especially if we're concerned about, you know, thinking about we're going to have this whole world powered by computers and we're worried about the, you know, environmental crisis with energy and so forth. Brains are very efficient. Brains are very efficient. If we could ever figure out how that happens, that would be a really interesting kind of thing to solve. And that's the way I would kind of look at the brain issue. Yeah. That's an interesting, I mean, it's a kind of a good, a good question. We have to end, actually. We've been told to wrap. It's a good question. It's a good uh, answer to end on. And the, and the question, you know, to be left with really on, which, uh, which is the more you know, efficient and productive path to create smart machines or to try to make people smarter? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.